partners of Jensen Franklin Media Ministries. Welcome to Kingdom Connection. I'm very thankful that you're joining me today. And I want to wish you and all of your family a happy Easter. Today we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We believe this. And I believe no matter what you're facing today, if you'll lean in and listen to this message, it's going to speak directly to you. It's going to fill you with hope. It's going to fill you with faith. So let's go right into the service recorded right here at Free Chapel. I believe God is going to speak to you today. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open them with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. And I want to I want to zero in on verse 35. But someone will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? What's the body like that's resurrected? What is it going to be like when we are resurrected? What what how can that happen and what's it going to be like? Paul says in verse 36, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. He goes on to say in, in verse 37, it's like a grain. He compares it to a grain. Notice that. And then for the sake of time, I want to go down to verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when the corruptible has put on incorruption, and the mortal put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Everybody read verse 55 out loud now. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? I want to I begin today by reminding you of something that you don't like to think about. And it's simply this. People die. All people die. And sometimes they die in strange ways. For example, I heard and read about a woman by the name of Amelia Lynch. She was standing, true story, on a street in New York City. A flower pot fell from the eighth story of a building because it was struck with lightning and hit her in the head and killed her. She wasn't looking to die that day. She just died. It was a freak accident, we would call it. Then there was a man by the name of Carlos Bumbus. True story, he was fishing in the Philippines. And he opened his mouth to yawn. And I hope if you open yours and yawn at me while I'm preaching. <laughs> and while the man was fishing, he opened his mouth to yawn and a small fish jumped out of the water into his mouth, got lodged in his throat, and tragically, he choked to death and died. I don't know why we're all smiling. It's a sad story, but it's a true story. You see, with every tick of the clock, every tick of the clock, someone dies somewhere. One of those ticks has my name on it. One of those ticks has your name on it. It's already an appointment. You don't make it. God does. It's appointed unto man once to die. All these young people looking at TikTok, Tick tock, tick tock. One of those ticks has your name on it. But I have great news this morning. When death does come, it cannot kill you if you are in Jesus Christ. It can't, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The moment a Christian dies, their spirit leaves this world and they're instantly in the presence of God Almighty. The body is left behind, but they have gone to another world. Jesus has become the death of death. Death died when Jesus died on, the Calvary, on Calvary and when he rose on the third day. I thought about how that, how that this thing is going to take place. 
He said, I show you a mystery that those that are asleep are dead in Christ. First Thessalonians said they will be raised first and we who are alive and remain, meaning there will be a generation. I believe we are that generation that will be alive when the trumpet sounds and the two, the dead in Christ shall rise first because they're six feet under and they will rise first. Their bodies, their spirits will come back with Jesus and the spirit will connect with the body. The bodies will come alive. They'll be given resurrected bodies because the story of resurrection is not just about Jesus raising from the dead, but he guaranteed every one of us will have a bodily resurrection. And then the, those who are living will be caught up together with the dead in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. It's really something, and it's, it's like a man in a machine shop, and he, he works all day, and he makes a mess, and he sweeps up all the stuff in there, and he's got paper, and he's got wood chips, and he's got all kinds of stuff, and if he's smart, he also has screws and washers and, 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 and nuts that are, that are valuable, and he doesn't want to lose them, so he has him a magnet. And so he'll reach down, and instead of digging through all that stuff, all he's got to do is pull up with a magnet that which has some of what the magnet has will connect with it, and gravity loses its hold. Well, I'm telling you, the Bible put it like this. If the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, listen to this, it shall also quicken your mortal bodies. One of these days, morning, night, or noon, I don't know when, but soon and very soon, a trumpet is going to sound. Jesus is going to return. And suddenly those who are living the life that brings glory to Jesus will feel a quickening and you will receive, if you're alive, a glorified, resurrected body. The dead in Christ in the Bible, put it like this, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, everybody look at me and blink your eyes, boom, and open that's how quick it's going to happen. And we shall be changed. What a moment that's going to be when Jesus appears in the clouds. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that we're going to have resurrected bodies. And somebody asked the Apostle Paul, how can the body be resurrected? It's a great question. I want to give you how. You know, I read a little true story about a man in London, England by the name of Solomon Pease. P-E-A-S, Pease, Solomon Pease. And he thought he'd have fun with it. It was his death, and he made sure that he left the wording on his tombstone. Here's what he said. Beneath this sod and beneath these trees lies the body of Solomon Pease. But this ain't the Pease, it's just the pod. The peas shelled out and went to God. <laughs> I like that. Well, I just want to tell you today that this body is just the pod. And one of these days, we're going to shed it and we're going to go be with God. And then he's going to give us a glorified, resurrected body. At that moment, the apostle Paul said to King Agrippa, Who should, why should it be considered an incredible thing to you that God can raise the dead. I'm going to tell you something. If you can get past Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You ought to be able to believe anything. And if God could take nothing and make it into something, he can take what's left of a body and resurrect it and cause it to have life eternal because he's that kind of God. He said it's like a grain. And unless a grain falls to the ground, is sown into the ground and then it decays and it rots and it dies. But inside of that grain, after it's buried, is a source of life that is germinating. You can't put your finger on it, but even though it looks bad, decayed, and dead, there is a source of life that is germinating, and he used grain because he wanted us to understand that what it went into the ground, it's coming out of the ground what it was. And that is exactly how our resurrected bodies will be. It's like grain. Let me give you an example. Somebody says, well, how can the body be resurrected? 
Think about a man who, let's say he was born in Florida many years ago, and he lived his life, and then, then he went to Vietnam, and while he was in Vietnam serving, he stepped on a landmine and blew his leg up, and his leg was left in Vietnam. And he came home, and maybe he moved to Georgia, got a job at a lumber mill, and somehow he accidentally cut two of his fingers off. I'm just making this story up, so... <laughs> And the fingers fell off in Georgia. And then, let's say he felt the call to preach and went to Africa and preached in Africa until he died. And they buried him under an apple tree. And the roots of that apple tree go down into the dirt and they draw the nutrients from his decayed body. And through the roots, it feeds the tree. And suddenly there's apples on the tree and the apples fall off of the tree and a hog comes along and eats the apples and goes and strows it all over the place. How in the world is that man's body who has a leg in Vietnam and fingers in Georgia and body parts all over Africa, how is God going to raise him up? The Bible is so astounding that God, before scientists ever discovered DNA and, and stem cell research, God said in Psalms 139 in verse 16, your eyes did see my substance, yet when I was unformed. And in your book, all my body parts or members were written and recorded when there were none of them. You know what he's describing? You know, everything that you are comes out of stem, stem cells and comes out of DNA. DNA is what causes you, tells what, the length of your fingers, the, your arms, the color of your hair. Everything comes out of your DNA. And God said, I had it all in a book, all your body parts. I had it coded in. And, and I don't care how much you change, you will always be you because you have your DNA code. Now, what I want you to understand is just like that, that seed goes into the ground one day when the trumpet sounds, I don't care where you are. I don't care if you got a leg in Vietnam and fingers in Africa. I don't care if you've been torn to pieces and your body is decayed. God's going to punch your card in up in heaven. He's got a book that's got your DNA. And suddenly that body will, just like the valley of dry bones, bones will come to bones in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and you're going to get a resurrected body, and it will be powerful, and it will be eternal. Hallelujah. Secondly, and I just got three quick points, but secondly, he talks about the individual uniqueness of the resurrected body. Paul does. God does not make copies. He makes originals. God is not going to make us all the same when we get glorified. We all going to put on white robes and, and, and walk before the... No, we're going to be, you will be you. I will be me. We will know one another. The Bible is very clear about that. When Moses and Elijah went on the mountain, you know, they lived 1,500 years before Jesus came on the earth. And when they went on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus... The Bible said the disciples instantly knew who Elijah was and who, Jesus, and who Moses was and who Jesus was. And by the way, that's a beautiful picture of the rapture because he had Moses up there and Moses died and the, angels fought, the angel had to fault Michael. The angel had to fight the devil over his body because Satan wanted his body. He's buried in the mountain of Nebo. And watch this. So you got, you got those who die in Christ on the mountain of transfiguration. And then who else was there? Elijah. Elijah never died. He was caught up in a fiery chariot. So you've got the living and the dead. And right in the middle, you've got Jesus lighting them up. Now, what I want you to understand, what I want you to understand is in heaven, there will be a uniqueness to you and, to, and, and you will be known even as you know. If you know people here, you will know them there, but you will have supernatural knowledge. Your mind will be so increased, you only use a small percentage of your brain, but you'll know everybody because of the kindredship of the fellowship of the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. You'll just know everybody and they'll know you. You know, it's bad when people come up to me and they say, do you remember me? That's my most dreaded question that somebody can ask me. And I, I'm good with faces, and I try not to lie because I don't want to go to hell. So I'll say, remind me. If you, I'm giving you all my secrets. So 
you look familiar is my go-to. <laughs> but in heaven, I'll never be embarrassed. I'll know that one and that one. And Paul will know me and Peter will know me and know you. And we're going to have a, whoa, hallelujah. Take a praise break. Just take a praise break. Woo, I feel like shouting. I'm enjoying my own preaching. Hallelujah. <laughs> God is a God of variety. And he says in this text, just as the stars glory one from another, one's brighter than the other, so will the resurrection of the dead be. Just like bodies are different from one another, just like snowflakes, there are no two that are the same, no two fingerprints that are the same. A little boy got a, got a gift from his mother for, um, for Christmas. It was a fingerprint set. And she came to him and said, how do you like it, son? And he said, well, I like it, mom, but... But the man who wrote the instructions lied. And she said, why do you say that, son? He said, because he said that you, there's only one fingerprint for, for every person, and that's not true. He said, I know for a fact that my dad and Santa Claus and whoever keeps breaking into my piggy bank, is the, they all three have the same <laughs> fingerprint. I'm telling you today that if you know, if you know somebody here, you will know them there. I believe the first people we'll see when we go through the gates of Pearl will be the people in our own family that have gone before us. I got a daddy over there. I've got a brother over there. And because of Jesus and his love for me and my family, one day we're going to be reunited on streets of gold. The sorrow will be gone. The pain will be gone. God shall wipe every tear from our eyes. We're headed to a mighty, mighty place. We will know each other in heaven. Thirdly, let me give you this, and this is the great news right here now. He said, not only will you be like a grain, and not only will you be unique, but he said, in your resurrected body, it will be infused with perfection. That the best that you've ever been at the tip top shape that you've ever been in, it's just not that good. Let me put it like Paul put it. He said, we're sown, meaning we go into the ground in corruption, but we're raised in incorruption. The word corruption means decay. He said, we're sown, and listen to these words, dishonor, but raised in glory. Sown in weakness, but raised in power. Sown a natural body, Paul said, but raised a spiritual body. Your resurrected body will be infused with perfection. You've never known the body you're about to have. You say, I'm not sure I want my body in heaven. I get that. I understand that. But you'll want the one that God has for you. You'll like it. Your IQ will be unbelievable. Your body will be unbelievable. He said, God said, I'll take you as you're sown in dishonor, but you'll be raised in glory. You know what? God wants us all to have a glorious body. I love that. Who would say today you have a glorious body? Who would say that? Some of you really think you're something. But all, but, but, but all, but all I would say to you after all your PX90s and all your workouts and all your gym, and I'm all for it. I do it myself. I do. That's how I keep my high school figure. Amen. But, 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 but after it's all said and done, all I'd say to you who are in tip-top shape, I mean ripped and cut and all of that, all I would say to you is give it time. You're going to be attacked by the four Bs, baldness, bifocals, bunions, and bulges. It's going to get you sooner or later. But one of these days, God said, I'm going to give you a glorious body. We've never seen. If, if, if God were to cause Adam to step out of God's assembly line like he made him, we've never seen them ourselves not under the curse. If you could have seen the body that Adam had and Eve had before the fall, my Lord, if Adam walked out here, the women would swoo and faint and, and the men would need prayer when they saw Eve because you would not believe the glorious bodies God had for them. 
Boy, it makes me happy because after a year of COVID and after a year of death and breathing machines and funerals and disease and cancer, one of these days we're going to get a resurrected body. It's not susceptible to sickness, to pain, to aches, to hurts. What a, what a redeemer we have that he says, I don't just want your spirit. I'm going to redeem your body and give you a body that is glorious. Let me tell you what the scripture says. It says that, I, I just want to read it right out of the text because it's a good place to end. Listen to what he says. He says, now let me show you a mystery. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, incorruptible. Verse 54, so when this corruption has put on incorruption, mortal put on immortality. Then it'll be brought to pass. Death is swallowed up in victory. And then he makes this powerful statement. Listen. Oh, death. Death, where's your sting? It's two anthems there. One for the living and one for the dead. The first one is for those, that generation that is alive that never sees death because they get raptured. And so that's their part of the song. Oh, death, where's your sting? I never felt your sting. Death, what happened? We're going to get raptured. But then the second anthem is for the dead because they're going to look back <laughs> at the plot that they were buried in and say, oh, grave, where is your victory? The tombstone is toppled. The grave has exploded with resurrection power. The coffin has been burst wide open. And the living will say, death, where is your sting? I never felt your stinger. There was a little boy and a little girl who were in the garden with her mother. And while they were in the garden, a bumblebee came and it stung the boy. And after it stung the boy, the little sister saw it and it started buzzing all around her and she got hysterical and started screaming, panicking as it was buzzing, thinking that it was going to land and sting her. And the mother said, come here, darling. It's all right. And she took the hand of that boy and she showed the stinger that was in his hand from that bumblebee. And she said, look, it doesn't have a stinger anymore. The bee left the stinger in your brother. All it's got is the buzz. I have an elder brother by the name of Jesus. And he took the stinger out of death for me. And yeah, it's scary to hear a bad report and know that you're going to die. I, I, nobody looks forward to it. But all that death has is the buzz. It doesn't have the stinger for me anymore. Because death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? It's not there anymore. God, I, uh, I need your help. Are you the old pro? I am old. How do you see yourself? Not just in golf, but your whole existence, your life. I have a son who hates me, and my wife and I have been separated for about five years. Sounds like your game could use a mulligan. Sometimes God uses bad things for good. Ladies and gentlemen, make your tea time. This program has been sponsored by friends and partners of Jensen Franklin Media Ministries. We hope you've enjoyed this teaching by Jensen Franklin and thank you for your continued support of this ministry. For more information about this message and other ministry resources, visit us online at jensenfranklin.tv.